Okay, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we think this is the 14th one in this Secrets Re Revealed um, series, and it's all about um, house history. Um, John's told me it's a little bit longer than some of the other presentations because we have a lot in the collection, so that we might have less time at the end for questions. Okay, well, hey everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, Say so it's fourteenth one we think in the series. So this one's all about house history. So it's by by its nature, it's a little bit more longer than some of the other ones. So we'll we'll go straight into it. Um, so where to start with house history? Well, it doesn't matter where you live uh, or what you live in, it will have some sort of history. Um, However, whether you're going to be able to find much about it is another question, because with all historical research, a great deal depends on what survived. So there's going to be lots of different techniques you need to employ to use it. So you've got visual evidence, what you can see by looking at it, um, oral evidence by talking to people who knew the property around. This is often overlooked, that one. It's quite an important one. Um, archaeological evidence if it's on an ancient site or if it's an ancient place really but the main thing is essentially to do it you're going to be looking at documentary evidence and you're going to need to sort of look at a wide range of archive and other sources um, however there is this caveat not every source you'll see today will be relevant for every property and there's also the trouble with archives is sometimes these things they don't survive for whatever reason you can't find them or they were never created and something else is that you've got to remember is that the people who created these records weren't creating them for us they were creating them for use at the time so you know sometimes we think well why didn't they mention that well they didn't need to so that's something to bear in mind John, I'm sorry to interrupt. The sound doesn't seem to be as good as it usually is. Are, are, are you nice and close to your... Yeah, same as usual. Is that any better? Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe that should, should be okay. Okay, sorry about that, folks. But anyway, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, so there are three ways, three basic ways. Look at the building, the styles of it. It's bricks, the bonding, stone, woodwork, chimneys, roofing, beams, plaster, fireplaces, windows, etc. You can look at all that stuff and it will give you clues. Um, then you've got the site. Um, it might, might predate the building in terms of uh, activities or everything. So, you know, I think we can see where we're looking at here. And then finally, you've actually got the people who lived in the house and the, any events that might be associated with it. So then you can look at sort of the goods, furnishings and chattels and that sort of thing. There are lots of really good printed sources out there, books. Um, this is just a selection of ones that we've got in the archives and ones that we know are quite useful. Um, these will be, as, as always, we will have a um, exhibition on this and they will be listed at the end of that so you can look at. But there are some very good ones there. Even if they're, some of them are quite old, like the Discovering Your Old House, the Shy one, it's fairly old now, but it's still quite a good one. Um, in terms of printed local sources that you can consult, these are probably the best ones. So you've got the Victoria County History of Gloucestershire, uh, 11 Red Book volumes. You can access most of them now online. Um, and the other ones that are quite important are the Pesna series, the Buildings of England series, Gloucestershire. And Gloucestershire is covered in two volumes, volume one, the Cotswolds, and volume two, the Vale and the Forest of Dean. So again, you know, if you've got a specifically elderly old house in somewhere in a village, it might well be mentioned. You know, don't, as a rule, go into sort of like the suburbs or things like that, which we'll look at. So looking at the building itself, um, Firstly, look at the property. Any sh what shape is it? Any distinguishing features? In this picture here, it's obviously at the, you can see those black lines. It's the crook crook house. It's an old A-frame there, so it's quite an old one. Um, how old is it? Well, you can do this in a quick guesstimate. You know, is it modern, 40s, 50s, 60s, Victorian, Regency, Tudor, other? And we'll look at a little bit of these in a moment or so. Um, purpose. Did it once have a use that you can discern? You know, today we're seeing lots of church conversions, barn conversions. They weren't quite as popular in, the, in sort of older buildings, but, you know, sometimes they had other purposes as well. And um, also, where is it on the map? You know, urban, suburban or rural. Sometimes these can govern what you're going to find out about your property. 
So British architecture has evolved hugely over the years, and I'm just going to go through a few quick slides telling you about it. Um, the styles and features in architecture can be a great help, but they can also be a massive hindrance. So the first thing is the facade of the building. Um, it may actually be later than the building itself. This is very common in towns, especially where old buildings were given new frontages. This is the case with Berlin's house in Gloucester here. So it's an older property, but they've got this new Regency front on it. The date stones, people tend to swear by these, but to be honest, they don't always show the original date of the building, but they might show alterations or even when new owners acquired the property. So again, you can't always rely on those. And here's a nice little example here, Robert Rakes' his house in Gloucester, we've probably all seen it. Um, Built around 1560, grade two, it's been recently restored, costing 4.5 million, where virtually everything has been replaced in it. So, you know, do you class this as no building or not? So it's something to think about. Um, so, okay, so British architecture, very, very quick introduction. Tudor, Elizabeth and Stuart, final phase of medieval architecture in Britain, goes up to the late 1400s to the early 1700s. Typical features, masonry chimneys, grouped windows, the half timbering, which we sort of often see, steeply pitched gable roofs, lots of brick, even middle and lower class houses didn't change much during these, these periods, really. Georgian Regency um, lasted 1714 to 1820-ish, characterised by symmetry, uh, lots of ashlar, uniformly cut stones, often with ironwork. And it's brought, you know, lots of classical architecture came to sort of middle class homes and public buildings, so it's very useful. In towns, especially, you know, Cheltenham is the obvious one, um, you often got rows of identical terraced houses, okay, and they were built in the, in the region, Georgian Regency style. And this one is Holst's property in Cheltenham. Victorian time, a mass of styles, to be honest. Renaissance, Tudor, Mock Gothic, all became popular, um, often had a la a la la get me tongue in, elaborate detailing. Um, this is the uh, one up London Road in Gloucester, for the life of me, I just can't remember the name of it now, it's disappeared. But town clouds, houses, difference between the upper class, middle class villas, like you see at the top in the middle here, and the terraced housing. And this is a typical example of Gloucester Henry Street. It's a classic Victorian terrace in um, very common now, they, but it's nothing wrong with them at all. They're very nice houses. Edwardian, very short lived, influenced by the arts and crafts. Very, it went back to a simple design and we're in sort of in, almost in retaliation to the production, mass production of the Victorian age. So they were actually more squat wider with roomy, bigger rooms, bigger hallways, and more windows in the Victorian period. So, you know, there's a very slight difference in them. Uh, famous Art Deco period, very short lived again, less than 20 years. Um, you can recognize them quite easily if you see them, although few of them exist today. Although the, these, there's one your bottom, one on the bottom right, we'll recommend, recommend. You might have spotted if you've gone through Escort Road in Gloucester, it's there. And the ones up in Cheltenham and I'll drive again, are hidden away a bit more. Into the 1930s, this is when suburbia starts to appear. Um, and you get this sort of this building's nicknamed Tudor Beethan. So they were sort of, you know, rendered brick, some half timbering, you know, designed almost to look old, but it's still like the classic three bedroom semi detached houses. Um, interestingly, most were not built. In inner cities but they were built on the outskirts where at the time land was a lot cheaper um, so it allowed for less dense housing and you could get what they call ribbon development along the major arterial road so an escort road in Gloucester is classic on this. Um, as part of this you start to get new estates with smaller avenues, crescents, cul-de-sacs and you get this quintessential image of British suburbia which starts to spring up. Um, Post-World War II suburban style, a mix of styles again came to the fore, although mostly plain, plain brick with little decoration, and as well as two-storey houses, this is where you get the era of the bungalow, the single-storey bungalow becomes quite common here. And we'll very quickly look at post-World War II urban, the brutalism, where after the many of these cities in World War II afterwards needed quickly to build, quite quick, housing to combat lots of people, initially for sort of urban public buildings, but later it became to dominate housing as well. And of course, now these are on the sort of often now being demolished for something else. So what else can we see? Well, street and road names. Um, 
they can sometimes hint at past use in the area. So if you get like a, here, you get St. Luke Street, like a named church street. Usually it means it was close to a church. There might even have been a church there. Not necessarily there today, perhaps. Ones with Albion Street, that was a very commonly associated with non-conformist chapel. So again, somewhere around there on that street, you're probably looking for a chapel of some sort. In Gloucester, we've got the, the Friars communities, the Grey Friars, the Black Friars, and, and the newly sort of discovered White Friars just pop up. And again, whole areas were named after these places. And again, also in Gloucester, you've got the Gate Street. So you've got Southgate, Northgate, Westgate, and they generally do lead out to a gate somewhere on the city. Um, you know, Gloucester's lucky like that. Some places don't have them as much. Sirencester, for example, has still got Spitalgate, which is a street, which is still there. Street road names in suburban areas, very little definite material here. You've got, they can be chosen for a much more mixed range of reasons. You frequently get themes when they built an estate. So you get cathedral cities, shrubs, local places or poets. That's, that's all there. Um, and as such, they very rarely betray the historical buildings, origins for any buildings. There can, however, be exceptions. And a local one up near me is this one, Holbert Crescent. Um, it's named after the last residents of Upheverly Farm, and the whole farm was demolished around about 1985 to make way for the Morrison's um, shop and the new estates on the southern edge of Cheltenham. Um, that's an image from the Know Your Place, the modern map of Know Your Place. There's no trace in the farm there at all. But if you can, like this there, overlaid where the farm was, you can see where it was. And we'll look at Know Your Place and mapping it in a moment. Um, however, although it's called Holbert Crescent, this says leading to Glebe Farm Court. Um, as far as I can ascertain, it was never church or glebe land, so that part of the road is invented. And I remember the farm well because I used to collect eggs from the barn on the left with the old Jeff Albert. Um, and he was, that was when I was about sort of six or seven, but I used to do it quite a lot, I used to enjoy it. Looking at um, street road names in rural settings, they tend to be far more straightforward. So this is just a quick look at Bisley. Um, so you've got, you can see there, Cheltenham Road, Stroud Road. Well, these are directional roads. You know, that's the name. If you want to go Cheltenham or Stroud, you would take this road or that road. Around about, you've got sort of rural features or purposes. So you've got Lime Kiln Lane there, Hay Hedge Lane, Wells Road. You know, these are all, you know, there is something there that's named after. Inside the village, and with most villages, you nearly always get a high street, which is the main street. You'll very often get another street called the back lane, which gets you to the same place, but via a different route, and it's just not as important. And then you get streets named after buildings in there. So in Bisley, you've got the George Street, which was named after a pub at one time. But even now, you do get oddballs. So here you can see on the right-hand side there, top, Van der Brin Street. Now, I've, I've done a very small amount of digging about this one and I can't I don't know why it's called that so if anybody does let us know it's quite an interesting one um, street house numbers, um, they usually can't be relied on to identify a property, especially older ones, as they do change over time. So today, um, odd numbers tend to be on one side of the street and even numbers on another, although in cul-de-sacs and filling properties, the numbering can be way more haphazard. But in the 1800s, actually common for numbers to proceed sequentially up one side of the street and down the other. Um, so when new houses were built, say, on the end of the row, they just renumbered the whole thing from start to end again. So, again, these numbers can be quite complicated. And this is a typical example of that. This is from Cheltenham, which is now St George's Road. If you can see the map on the left, the 1850 Board of Health one, um, you can see at the bottom corner, number one, but it's called Basil Terrace there. Um, it's now number 29, St George's Road. So they've taken the name of the road and put it onto the buildings, whereas before the buildings were actually a terrace of their own. Property names, these can sometimes betray the origins but houses can be named after anything so where you've got like the old smithy the old dairy the old post office barn these were usually sort of adopted from working buildings and there's lots of these around today especially on the outskirts of towns you can get personal names um so Turval is one i know that's named after the owners terry and val um you can get honeymoon destinations purbeck was just the one that my house was called because of my mum and dad went on their honeymoon and of course you then get the retirement homes that done roaming and all those sorts of names. 
In towns now, you often see mews. These are very common. Uh, originally, they were the name for a row of buildings or a courtyard of stables and carriage houses built behind the larger houses where the servants could live. And of course, now these the big houses have sort of gone or been split up, so they've opened up the mews, and it's become a popular thing for sort of the infills in towns and, and even on estates now. So your prime archival source for any property is going to be the deeds of it. Um, they're legal documents, they technically belong to the house, as it were, so they can be, usually be found with either the current owner, the owner's solicitors, or the owner's mortgage lenders. We've got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of deeds in GA, but fortunately, deeds haven't survived for every property and not every bundle grouping of deeds is complete. So, you know, you can find out a lot of information, which we'll see about in a moment, but, you know, sometimes you're missing that critical piece you need. Today, HM Land Registry holds records of all properties sold since 1993, and they this includes the title register, the plan, title summary, and a flood risk indicator introduced quite recently. They do like, now if you sell buy or sell houses, they do like to add on to this, so this is something, you know, it, it's a growing resource and it'll become even better in future years, I feel. So deeds can provide lots of information and because they can provide lots of information, you do have lots of deeds. And this is a typical bundle you can see on the on the right made of parchment. They're not the easiest things in the in the world to use, has to be said. But the information they contain can be wonderful. So they record the names of those who owned or occupied the property at various times. They record what the extent and the boundaries of the properties are, though often you know, this is couched in terms of other properties around it. They can indicate date and building and subsequent alterations to the land, such as that you might often find one message divided into two tenements. So it's, that's indicating where an initial plan has been split into two. Um, some do have footprints showing the boundaries, so a little map or plan, which is easier. Um, and they often can say, contain sort of um, informa useful information, miscellaneous properties about what's around them as well. So again, they can be very, very good. However, uh, sometimes new deeds can be altered and new ones drawn up to reflect legal changes. Um, when this happens, you normally get more physical material added to deeds. So very often with this, you'll get something called an epitome of title that summarizes the existing deeds uh, and their contents. It also does any earlier ones. So occasionally when this happens, you get the older deeds would be destroyed um, unless they have to find a way to an archive. Now, like everything, there's, there's no... You know, people don't have to deposit or firms don't have to deposit these things with us. And there is a spate in the sort of in the 80s and 90s where they were simply destroyed, being the e easiest way to actually keep look after them. People didn't need them anymore. So they'd, rather than give them to us, they would actually get rid of them. So deeds are very often um, quite large, unwieldy things. I mentioned it earlier. Um, and this one is roughly a meter square. So it's big, it's awkward to use, and they may look completely daunting, but with a little knowledge, um, they're not the indecipherable things that they, they appear to be. And the most important thing here is firstly, they always tend to follow a set pattern. And these sections are usually separated by bold text. So in this example here, okay, um, you get the date, that's always at the top, and it's the dates in regnal years. So it's like the 18th year of Charles II's reign, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so then you've got the date. So then afterwards you get the parties and it's usually listed as between, and then it would give the names of the people who actually were exchanging the property. It can be multiple names, and they're often couched in quite long phrases, sort of like John Putley, gent of the town of Cheltenham in the county of Gloucestershire, you know, and that would go on for every person. So they can be quite big and unwieldy. Then you'll have another section, you can see it here, it says all that. So this details the property. So this is listing you know, all that part of the land of this tenement, which goes from here to here to there to there, etc, etc. And then finally, you'll get sort of any restrictions and qualifications. These often relates to family arrangements or, you know, um, yeah, somebody gets married, the part of the property goes to somebody else, etc, etc. And this can be the real complicated bit. Um, and very often it's got some good juicy details, but we don't always need to know it. That usually starts with and, and there can be you know, several or lots of ands through this.
Um, one of the biggest obstacles we think we're going to find is the handwriting, because there are some odd letter forms and you get some really strange spellings. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, I've just got a couple of examples here. You know, you can see here City of Gloucester. Look at that funny C at the start. Um, beneath it, Our Lord. Look at the R's, you know, really interesting. And then you've got County down again, you know, different spelling to what we, we, we're used to. So there can be challenges, has to be said. Um, but there are certain things, even so, that are, that are in our favour when we come to this sort of thing. Is firstly, most of these, especially the early ones, were written by professional scribes and clerks. That's all they did. So their writing is generally quite consistent and quite good. Once you get your eye into that, the words do start to become easier. You know, and if you think back to especially where it is in the deed, you've probably got a good idea of what it's talking about. So there are going to be some words you're going to know. You know, typically this is like, say again, a name, the date or the place perhaps, you know. So again, that's in our favour. Um, usually if you're just doing house history, unless you really, you know, unless you really want to punish yourself, you don't need to do the whole thing. You can pull out the bits of information that you're looking for. Um, one thing we always say is if you get stuck, try covering the word up and work it, let's write it down the forms from back to front. That way your mind doesn't jump to words it could be. And then you actually, you, can, you know, look out for odd words, try saying things phonetically. And this is one that, that got a lot of us a while ago. Um, you know, it was spelt lickwise and we just couldn't think what it was. And then Judy Kimber said, ah, oh, it's likewise. So, you know, look for these sorts of strange ones as well. And again, there are lots of good handwriting guides available. This is a fairly new one. It's very good. I thoroughly recommend it. I always like this one. It looks like it should be for kids, but it's, it's a very good book, Secretary and ABC. And also, if you're interested in this sort of thing, the National Archives, they do a free online paleography course, which you can find, you know, go on to the National Archives, put paleography course and you'll find it. And that's very good. So you get an image of the document, you get a transcript and you get exercises you can do to try and understand it. So again, thoroughly recommend that if you've not done it at all. Um, the worst ones are what we call the copy deeds. And these were sort of done for any reason, you know, perhaps they need another copy in the office, something like that. Um, and because the people writing these were generally not as skilled as the main people, they can be rather scribbly. And this is one for a, a messwidge and a pertensist parts of land. And it, they're called T. Rees, Ap Howell, Ap Morris. So Ty Rees, son of Howell, son of Morris in Montgomeryshire, Wales. Don't ask me why we've got it. We have it. Um, but you can see it is pretty scribbly writing. But even so, you know, look at that for a few minutes and, you know, with an eye, you'll get to read some things. Um, I originally pulled this out simply because on the line, there I've arrowed it says you know a fat goose and a couple of capons at the feast and nativity which is just about readable in that line there so even so you know there are challenges but sometimes you can read these things reasonably well however you might have to learn a new language. So this is a lovely deed written about 1270. It records a grant of land in Standish uh, made between the Colthrop um, people. And again um, it's worth looking at because it, it does look quite difficult. And you, you must be looking at that thinking, I can't read anything on there. But if you look at it a little bit closer, you can. So look at the top line and it's the one, two, three, four, fifth, sixth word in. You can see a name that are Johannes de Colthrop. So you've got a name already. Carry on along that line and you'll come to Willow. It looks like Witto de Colthorpe, William de Colthorpe. So you can can in sort of like get these things with your eye in. You're not going to know anything. You're going to need somebody who can do Latin, but you know you can be, get some names out. The one I like about this one is on the third line down, and it's the sort of fifth word in Turtlesbrook. Okay, that's a boundary of one of these lands, um, and you don't really want to ask what's flown through that stream because it is what it seems like. Trade directories, we've got lots of these in the archives. They're another good way of linking into deeds, especially when you get names and properties. They're available generally in, in town and county editions. Um, the county ones tend to contain less information uh, than the town ones, which go a lot bigger. Uh, and again, the only problem is dates. Prior to the 1850s, there are very, very few of them. There's the odd one or two. But 
good coverage starts from about 1870 and continues on into the 1970s. So we've got good runs of these. And that's an example of the later ones on the right. But, you know, look at this one here from Gloucester, 1873. Sometimes you'll get adverts for people in there as well. And then you can trace them back. I mean, this one's for Thomas Green, a trunk maker. If you look on the right hand side, number 49 down there, you can see Thomas Green trunk maker. So sometimes you can get a little bit more information than you would otherwise. So looking at wills, these again, these are also can be very useful because testators, so when somebody does, they usually bequeath the property they owned, um, are often the possessions in the house. And, you know, we all lots of great stories about this sort of thing. This example is from a lady called Joan Painter uh, in Gloucester in 1667. She owned what is now 109 to 111 Westgate Street. And this is her will. Now, it has to be said, it's a little bit you know, a little bit rougher than most wills are, but even so, you know, it's fairly easy to read once you look at it. Um, you know, that little highlight I've just pulled out there, it starts on the far right hand side with, I give and devise all my great messuage and tenements with all the pertences, that is one word there, and all houses, edifices, buildings, gardens, courts, backsides, and hereditaments thereunto belonging, lying, and being within the said parish of Nicholas within the said county of Gloucester, now in my possession. So you can see what I mean, they're very long winded. Of course, you know, the reason why they're long winded, well, the clerks were paid by the word, so they're not going to make it nice and short. They're going to put as much lettering in there as they can. Coupled with wills, you get inventories usually. Um, so these are great because if you've got the house you're looking at and you find an inventory of somebody that lived there, you often get a lot more extra information. And this is this is one again, it's a fairly typical one. Um, and you know, okay, it's not the easiest thing to read, but again, get your eye in, it's not too bad. And you know the layout it's going to be, it's going to be fairly simple. You always get <coughs> item or imprimis on the front of it. And then, for example, this one we've got in the chamber over the parlor, in the chamber over the hall, in the chamber over the kitchen, in the cockloft, small room over the kitchen chamber. So if you get this, very often you will get things in there as well. Dog eye, fire dogs is one, you know, pans, bedsteads, cupboards, that sort of stuff. So it does give you a tremendous amount of information about the owner's lifestyle, how they lived, you know, and these can be great. Sadly, they don't survive for every property or every will, you know, but if you're lucky enough to find one, they can be really useful. Um, we've no doubt we've all heard about census and census returns. They are invaluable when it comes to house or building history. Um, they're taken every 10 years, available online at Ancestral Find My Past, which you can get free access to those at the Heritage Herbert County Libraries, or you can subscribe, or you can go and visit the Gloucester Family History Society. They do it as well. The years covered at the moment, 1841 up to 1921. So some Great coverage there, although the latter is only available at Find My Pass. The online index is free, but you have to pay to get a per entry sort of thing. So, you know, it's a commercial money making thing, sadly. Um, however, they are very useful. They can give a lot of information. Sometimes you can get house numbers, but as I said, you've got to beware about those. Um, finding your way around the census is usually fairly straightforward, especially if you're in a town or village, because the numerators had to record the routes they took. And you can very often figure out where they went by looking at this route. So, again, if you've not looked at them, thoroughly recommend you do. Um, taxation is another way of finding getting into this house history, um, and they can be both local and national records. There's been lots of different types of sort of survive. Sometimes they contain the information is very variable. They can have information pertaining to the property or to the owners or occupiers. So sometimes you don't get a full picture. Um, the earliest usable source really is the 1597 Poor Law Act, which ordered the creation of parish overseers of the poor who could raise revenue by imposing local rates. And this is an example from Thornbury overseers, um, shows the poor rate that was sort of collected for the parish. But as you can, you know, roughly make out there, it just gives name and how much the person paid. So it doesn't give you any details. But of course, you know, if one person paid a lot, the next person paid little, you can in sort of infer the size of the property that you might be looking at. Half tax, again, it's, it's often quoted as being very useful. It's okay, it's not brilliant. Uh, it was charged at two shilling per half per year uh, from 1662 to 1688, so not that long, really. 
as I say, can be useful, but because not every room in a house has a hearth, you can only really judge the size of the dwelling and how much they were charged, and you can only sort of judge it relative to the next house along the road. Um, we don't hold the original copies, they're held at the National Archives. Uh, but we do have a, a very, very old photocopy of it, has to be said. Um, but this is online site, zamira.co.uk, um, which has Gloucestershire half tax on it. So I thoroughly recommend you go to visit that. Again, with all these things, it's worth getting this information if you can. If you can find your property on there, brilliant. If you can't, well, you've looked. The window tax, um, forced from 1697 up to 1851, two shillings per year, but 10 shillings for, with, if you had the house had 10 windows or over. There were some variations on that. Um, it did lead to everybody thinking, oh, you know, if I see a bricked up window in a house, it must be because of the window tax. But actually, evidence suggests they, this quite actually wasn't that high. People didn't do it for that often. It became a fashion to put a bricked up window in, so your house looked like it was more expensive than it was. And of course, obviously, some are later blocked for internal alterations. And this isn't a Gloucestershire property, but you can just see either side of that top window where there's bricks been put in. And I would suspect this one has been done for a window tax because it, it's blocked off everything. Sometimes there were houses you see where there are just pretend windows. They are the ones that is just built for fakeness, as it were. This is one. Well, this is from Dimmock in, in Gloucestershire. Um, and this house has got a, a false window painted on it. Now, I don't know quite why this is. I don't know how old it is. It certainly looks as though it might be quite old because it matches the window opposite the other side of the chimney. But again, this is something you've got to sort of look out for every now and then. And these are some examples of window tax returns we have in the archives. You have, they're not grouped together in one place. You normally have to search the catalogue for them or look for parish ones. Um, the one on the left hand side here is for Stinchcombe um, and the one on the right hand side is the East, East Leach Turville about 100 years between the two. So you can see where the early return basically just gives names of a person and the amounts. The later one actually has the name of the occupier um, and it has the number of windows charged uh, and then a figure as well. So that's far more useful. But, you know, times change, the information people wanted changes. So land tax as well, there's been some sort of land tax in existence from 1693 up until 1963, so a quite a long period. Um, records of the main land tax series are of use, they own property owners and tenants, and they both they put them in a parish in a place in a year, which can be quite useful, especially if you're chasing somebody. Um, the main series in Gloucestershire starts 1775 and arranged in hundreds and then by parish in the hundreds. They're available on Ancestry, so you can search that for personal names or you can browse it by place. And this is an entry here on the right for Brightwell Barrows 100. Um, for the parish of Oldsworth. So again, not many people played it, but you know, those that did. Other things, they survived scattered throughout the archives. They come up as odd little receipts like the other, other image here. Um, so they're not listed together in one place. The main series I think we're probably all aware of is the, is the 1909 Finance Act, the Lloyd George um, Act, Finance Act map, um, triggered by the People's Budget of 1909, which basically funded old aid pensions, uh, but then a dreadnought battleship building programme to try and compete with Germany, so it needed a lot more money in. Um, and the purpose was to tax, it's an oddball really, capital appreciation of property that was basically attributable only to the site. So it excluded profit from crops, buildings and improvements, but was surely focused on the fact that this building this year is worth X pounds, next year it's worth X plus one pound. So it's like an, almost like an inflationary one. Um, for house history, it's very, very useful. Um, it's created things called valuation books, which were nicknamed the doomsday books. Um, there's things called form 37s, which is gathered the material which went into the doomsday books, but most importantly, it gathered, a, created a whole load of maps based on the second edition ordinance survey maps, where the individual hereditaments or properties, they call them hereditaments in the thing, just to make it complicated and long-winded, um, were marked up in different colours and numbered, and then the numbers refer to the property in the valuation books. Now, if you're interested in these, the Bristol and Gloucestershire Archaeological Society has created an excellent website on them, which you can see there. And you can go to there and you can search this either by map place or by the hereditary number, by parish or by place. So it's still being put together, but it's a fantastic resource uh, and it's, it's really handy to use. 
Um, of course, local authority taxation mostly related to boards of health in the early days, and they administered services such as sanitation, water supply, burial grounds, and so they levied rates to pay for this. They were later absorbed by sort of the borough, urban and rural district councils. Um, and often these created extra ratings. So lighting and pavement, paving ones were quite, um, quite important. Shelton had a lot of those, for example. Um, so for about 1840, they used a printed book to sort of list these things. They usually list the houses street by street, the value of the property, the name and the amount assessed, and they can be useful. Um, they, they can also be hellishly dull and they're quite big, they're quite dirty volumes and they take a lot of searching through to be honest, but there are some available. Again, you tend to find them mainly for the, the, the big ones. So Cheltenham's got quite a good run of them, but you'll get so many of them. There's ones for like for North Leach, places like that. So they are worth looking at if you're, if you're stuck and if you're just trying to find everything you can. Oh, I can move on then. There you go. Um, electoral registers <clears throat> um, start in 1832, list, basically list about three people and their dog who could all vote. Um, so by that, at that time, you could only vote if you had sufficient property qualifications. There's, lots of niceties in this so it's only really from 1928 when you get women achieved equal voting rights that all adults and occupiers were in these lists so before prior to that if you're if the lady you're looking at had a house she's not going to be in there to vote because she didn't qualify which is crazy but <clears throat> the way it was um, they're divided into parliamentary divisions, and you have to be careful because these have changed over time. Um, uh, we have maintained a little list of these on the, in the search room if you need to look for them. It's also an online version we can we can direct you to as well. Um, but you know, once you find find where you're looking at, you know, you'll see a property qualification like this one here for this is Whittington Parish of Dowdswell, um, and this is actually the village of Dowdswell itself, or part of it anyway. And you can see the sort of thing you'll get. So you get a name, you get a place of abode, what's the nature, dwelling house, land or tenement, that sort of thing. So again, they can be quite useful, but they don't have a massive amount of information about property on it really. They can also be searched on Ancestry, which is it's quite a good way of searching for it because it's the, normally the quickest. So maps and mapping. Um, I can't, can't promote these two sites enough. Know your place, west of England, free to use comparative sites. So you can have an old map one side and the modern map the other, and you can slide over. It's really good if the property you're looking at maybe doesn't exist anymore, or you know it's been emerged to other places, so you can see how and when. Um, they've got maps on there. They've got enclosure maps, tithe maps, which we'll look at in a moment, that sort of thing, up to up to sort of town maps as well. Insurance maps can be quite handy, but they don't. They only tend to be in one place. They don't go around the county. Um, and if you sort of like, you know, thank God there's a National Library of Scotland because they actually put up when they digitised the OS maps of Scotland. They thought, well, we've got to move. We may as well do it everywhere. So they did the whole of the UK as well. And again, you can go on there, pull out all these ordnance survey maps and you can find great information on them. So using those, this is using Know Your Place, this is just a quick example. So this is um, Long Levens in Gloucester. Um, so to your top right, you've got the road coming in from Cheltenham, bottom left, you've got Gloucester. Um, if you know Long Levens, you might pick out a few road signs there, well, no, no roads there. So this is in the 1880s, um, and you can, this is, gives you an example of how, what you can see. So this picture going over the top, 1930s. This is the 1924 edition. Oh, look how much housing has been built there. So again, if you're looking at sort of how places have developed, these maps are absolutely invaluable for you. The enclosure maps, enclosure act can be I or an E, depending. Um, basically, created what we see out in the countryside today. Um, it saw the end of open field agriculture, where you get one person that strips of land all over a parish, and it basically gathered it all up and gave people blocks. Although it's been ongoing since the medieval period, by the mid-1700s you've got the Enclosure Act movements, um, which normal for the big landowners in the village to obtain an Act of Parliament, which allowed them to overrule any local opposition, um, because it has to be said the changes the Enclosure maps and Acts brought always favoured the better off, while the poor tended to lose their rights to use common land and often lost the best land as well. 
And again, we might have heard this one. Fantastic rhymes that were done at the time. They hang the man and flog the woman that steals the goose from off the common. But let the greater villain loose that steals the common from the goose. The Lord demands that we intone and we take things we do not own. But leaves the Lord and ladies fine who take things that are yours or mine. Now, that's a traditional version. There is actually this bottom version as well, which was maybe what triggered that first one. Uh, but again, it's the same sentiment. It caused, the, the enclosure maps were you know, horrific at the time. They caused an awful lot of opposition. It generally took place between 1750 and 1850, but they did continue later. Uh, Elmstone Hardwick wasn't enclosed from 1918. Um, but so because of this early date, usually they're the earliest maps we have for any particular place if they were done. They're usually large, they have lots of colour, they're well drawn, I have information on them about landowners and plot numbers. And the accompanying award um, gives you the information about the plot numbers, tells you owners, tenants, you know, the size and the sort of a lot, each lot and its physical features, as well as wasteland. The, the, the awards, I have to be said, they're quite long winded. And again, they're written in a very sort of dreary um, hand at the time. So they're going to be quite hard. You can see all the enclosure maps for Gloucestershire on Know Your Place, West of England, while the apportionments can be viewed on, on a standalone PC in the Heritage Hub. But there's also a web link, which I'll include on the exhibition, but haven't done here. Give you an example of what it was. This is a pre-enclosure map of Cold Aston. Um, and the reason, if you focus in that little middle section there, sort of where those lines of sort of trees and hills are. So this is the pre-enclosure. And you can see all the little strips around the field. Um, go to the post-enclosure. They're all gone and you've got blocks of field own, owned by one person. In the previous one, the poor of the parish had strips everywhere in the bottom of the, this one in the bottom of the parish it's that little little sort of odd triangle thing um, just below the three green fields there so they'd lost an awful lot of land time with maps and apportionments Tithe Commutation Act of 1836 changed all tithe payments from payment in kind, so, you know, to cash. So basically, the vicar now wouldn't get a bundle of wheat, a couple of eggs and a bit of cheese. He would get like £3.50. Um, but they created tithe mats and apportionments recorded. But not every place has one because sometimes there are pr already private arrangements in place to pay the tithe in cash. So they didn't need to do these maps. So again, not everywhere has them. The maps vary in size, scale and accuracy, have to be said, but they generally cover a whole parish plus any extra parish, extra mural parish areas. Um, and they usually give field names, plots of land. The field names can be quite useful, can be quite entertaining. Um, they also generally often trigger place names on an estate, such as Hynham is a good example of that one. Um, the numbers on the maps refer to numbers in the apportionments, and you can find out, therefore, who owned the land, who occupied it. Um, they're usually the second earliest map of an area, and they can tell you a lot about where your ancestor lived and what they did and everything. The original tithe maps, again, said, no one free or free or charge on your place. Place If you want copies of them um, with the field names, you can go to Jeff Watkin maps. So he redrew them all for Gloucestershire and he sells them. So again, they're, they're really good, great for wall things and everything. The apportionments give you the landowner, occupier, land use and value. How much was the tithe? And again, transcripts of all of them have been done um, by Gloucester Archaeology and can be accessed on that website. Um, and again, it's fairly useful. You have to know where you're looking for is, is the only drawback to it. So, for example, this one, I was actually looking for something from the previous match in Sherdington. And of course, it comes up as Badgeworth because the tithe map was Badgeworth with Sherdington. So you have to find it there. So it can be a bit tricky to use, but it's, it's still very good information. Um, Sales particulars, um, they can be really, really wonderful things if they survive. They tend to be created for larger properties, especially when they were sold by auction. Um, and they often have plans and inventories attached to them. Um, and this is one of a Whitkill estate. You know, it's a little booklet. So that's the front cover on the left there. In the middle is the first page. And it goes through describing all the properties that were being sold, which are illustrated on that map, which is a pull-out one at the back. Um, the other great thing is, is... is properties are often sold more than once you can get multiple sale particulars for the same property but on different dates so you can again use it as a comparison so they're always worth looking for um 
planning records you've got these for most councils and rural district councils in Gloucester they start in 1850 really you've got what you call the build and control plans um, they can be quite hard to use and, and to be honest only a fraction of records have survived um, you know especially because if you get sort of 5,000 I'm building a garage at the back of my property well you know they tend to be sorted and only the most interesting ones are kept so they are very good but they can be quite hard to use um, building contracts, if you find them, they're wonderful ones. This is one from um, Richard Ripmore of Lower Slaughter and uh, uh, Valentine Strong of Tainton, rebuilding a house in 1656. And it sets out everything that Strong had to do to build this house. Um, you know, again, you can read it. It's fairly easy to read once you get your eye in. But I mean, there's lots of interesting bits in there. Um, you have to find and bring into place building and all such wall, stones, lime and mortar as should be necessary for the building of the said house. And I have to say in this one, um, the lime that was mentioned there, that took me a quite a while to decipher it's not written very well and I just couldn't think of what it was until all of a sudden I realized oh they used lime mortar so again it, it does help um, interestingly this house cost 200 pound about 21,000 pounds today but we've got a few of those not too many has to be said sadly this is another nice one. Sometimes if you're lucky, they all get plans of this property attached. And this is one for a farmhouse in Seancourt, um, where, you know, as well as itemising, it's about three pages of itemising what he's going to do, the contract. They've drawn a plan again, which and that's a very, very good plan. So if you have that property, you know, you must be laughing. It's a brilliant one. There are other sources you can use. Um, the Heritage Environment Record, the HER, used to be called the County Sites and Monuments Record. Um, you know, that's available to view online, so you can put a property in there and try and find it if there is any interest. This is for the Folk Museum at Gloucester. You can see on the right side there. They exist for other counties as well. And again, they, again, quite sort of like dry reading, but it can give you a reasonable amount of information. The other one is the natural, natural, national, 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 national heritage list for England. Um, it's the, it lists protected buildings, listed buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's free to search. You get a bit of information. So I just put up Stole Park very quickly just to see what it was like. Again, it can be very good. Okay, it tends to be for the bigger properties or the most important ones, but you never know. You know, the house you're looking at might have been might have been put on this register. Prints and pictures, um, they're not always the most accurate, but they can be very useful. This is the KIP print for Gloucester City, um, and it can be useful, especially if you can get high definition versions like this, this one here. So, you know, you can actually see individual properties here. And OK, maybe it's not, you know, they're going to be look like it is today, but it gives you a bit of information about what it was, which could be very important. If you own a country pile, or you're a lucky person, there are usually lots and lots of prints. So this is another one of Gatkin Park. We've got about 10, 10 different drawings of Gatkin Park in the archives at various times. So the bigger the place, usually the more information there is to find on it. Photographs. Um, they can be really, really useful, especially if they're dated and any people are named. Um, again, how, how many of us do that today? It's, it's, we don't, sadly, and there's a massive backlog of these things where they haven't. So in this example, in these images, for example, the top two, one showing Dimmock, one showing Hatherop, wonderful photos. OK, you can get a bit of information about the properties, but you don't know really anything about them. So, you know, for example, in the Hatherop one, is the gentleman standing by the gate? Is he actually the house owner? or is he just somebody walking by? Goes same with Dimmock, are the kids there? You know, are they actually of the property or are they just walking by looking at the car? Two bottom ones are slightly better. So you've got the old Smithy there at Gotherington, which is great. So we know we're looking at that building. Which one is it though, left or right? Probably the one on the right, but we're not sure. Also, we only know that one to a roughly, we think it's about 1910. So again, it's not been dated. The one on the other one is the Wagon and Horses at Cyrus Esther. Um, again, that's more useful. We know what the pub is because you can read it there. And it's got there the sign there, which you can't see on the, this version, but you can see in the full picture. It says Grand Reopening, basically. So we know when it was. and We know what the place is. So much more useful. Lots of non-archival resources. Um, if you go onto our website, you've got sort of our research guide, which can be very useful. There's one on house history, tide maps, enclosure, actually, things like that. So again, very useful. 
Um, the Gloucestershire Build and Recording Group, very useful organisation. They go, you know, they examine lots of properties and they write them up. And I came across this one while researching this. The University of the West of England, they have a construction website homepage. Um, if you go onto that, there's all sorts about how houses were built at the time and, and everything and features you can look for. So that's more the architectural side. But again, they're very useful. And I think, oh, there we go. That's brought us up to the end. Any questions you have, if we can't answer it in the chat session now, which you've got about five minutes of, just email us and we can try and point in the right direction. And I'm just advertising for our next event, 22nd of June, our Jubilee one, which is Secrets of Veal, the right royal county. It's going to be a look at, not so much about the Queen, but about royal interactions with Gloucestershire throughout history, as far as back as we can go. And also we've got a great one with the Passport to the Past, if you've got children um, or families. Um, the next one is the Pet Project on 6th of July, which will be a good one as well. So, um, actually, no, that's the one after, isn't it? That's the actually, one after. So on the next, the June one um, is, is about royal connections. Um, we're, we're focusing on the, on the Tudors. Um, that's right, yeah, because you've got to visit by a certain bar nefarious barber surgeon person, haven't you, as well? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. That, that was fascinating, as always. Thank you very much, John. So if you've got a question, please unmute yourself. We just had one thing in the chat, um, John, which was, was from uh, Vicky Satterley to say that, tell you that her parents live in Tether's End. So... Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you go. Yeah. Um, did, did anybody have a question or anything they wanted to tell us about? Uh, yeah. I would, please. I've been researching a house in Quedgley and um, I can go back as far as the census starts, but I can't <clears throat> get further back than that. It's just a small two, two up, two down sort of place mm -hmm. and I can't, I don't really know how to get further back than the census. Because if you've, if you've gone back to like 1841, is it you've managed to get that far back or are you at the 1850s? So, I think it's the 50s, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, can, it can be a problem. Um, depending on where it was, let's say have a look at the know your place, look for the tithe maps, look for the enclosure maps. If you can find the property on those two visually, you should be able to find information in the apportionments that, that go with them, although they're not on know your place, you have to look at them elsewhere. Okay, so that's something. And the other thing would be is if it's got a, a name, maybe sort of like, you know, Old Tide Cottage or Blacksmith, you might be able to find deeds for it. So you could go onto our online catalog, put the name of the property in and see what, see what you can find. There are, you can also search deeds by place. So you could just put sort of like deeds of Quedgley in and you'll get a big long list of the actual deeds we have for Quedgley. And you might be able to pin them down that way. It can be a quite long winded search, but it is possible. Again, the trouble is there might not be anything. So you, no. know, you don't know if there is, but uh, that's, that's a good starter, I think, anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you need help using the online catalogue, if you haven't done it before, just give us a ring and we can give you some yeah. guidance. About thank, you. You thank you. Um, so um, Tracy, um, hang on, let, let me just uh, so has ancestors who lived in Shepherd's Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> that was in Dorset, mind you, and he was a yeah. he was a shepherd. <laughs> That's very good. Thank you sometimes you, do you. get these 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 places, you know, where you get somebody somebody of certain names lived in a certain place. I, I'm not sure anybody would like to say Turtles Brock would be a, <laughs> in Standish would be a good one, but uh, yeah, there's, there are some lovely coincidences that pop up with doing this sort of thing. So, anybody else got anything to ask about or tell us before we? Say goodbye. All right. Just to say thank you very much. It was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank, yeah. You. thank you very much. Right. Yes. Thank you, John. It was excellent. So the next um, one you've already told us about, haven't you? And that's the that's board. right. Yeah. I guess we should say there will be an exhibition on this one going up in the next few days um which has, has a little bit more explanation of some of the slides i don't do all of them but it's got some of the more pertinent ones and a little bit more information and you'll find the links to the places i've mentioned on that as well so you can sort of look at them from there um it's a third thing i'd say is it can be quite intensive it can be quite long but if you can come back to it take your time with house history you can often find out you know a good bit of information so it's just keep, keep plugging away at it really so Thank if you. you've missed any information or if you missed any of the links that John shared today, you'll, you will be able to find those by going on the online 
exhibition which you can yeah. get to through our website can't you yeah. john yeah yes that's right yeah It'll be up in a couple of days i think so it's all done anyway <laughs> okay so thank you all very much for joining us um and we will hope to see you um next time so the next is the do you know the date for the June one, John? It's it is. Uh, hang on a second. It's the 22nd, I think it is. Yeah, it's uh, one, two. Yeah, it's the 22nd of June is the next next. So Wednesday, the 22nd of June. Hope yeah. to see you there. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, thank everybody. you, everybody. See uh, you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.